While in India, we did a conference on the book of Jude. And what we're going to look at this morning is what I closed that conference with, and that is the book ends of Jude. We are going to look at Jude verses 1 and 2 and verse 24 and 25. Stand with me, if you would, as I read the word of God. Because it is brief, I will read the entirety of the book of Jude. So listen as I read the word of God. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you appealing to contend to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also relying on their dreams defile the flesh, reject authority, blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they have walked in the way of Cain, and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error, and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts. As they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by the wind, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, followers of their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. Verse 17, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time, there will come scoffers, following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, build yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus that leads to eternal life and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy without fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority 
before all time and now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as I pray. Lord, we look to you at this time. As we have read your word, I just pray that you would bless now our consideration of it. We are so thankful, O oh God, that you have not left us without truth, without the gospel, without the message of your grace, the revelation of your person, your purpose, your power, and your glory. Lord, I pray as we consider the things that we do today that again our hearts would be just tremendously moved and opened with a sense of your greatness, of your mercy, your grace, your love, and kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God, help me as I seek to communicate these things to the dear people that you have brought together here this morning. Oh God, would you be glorified in our midst through the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. So here again, we come together and we take up the beginning and end of the book of Jude. The themes at the beginning and end of the book of Jude are not unique to this book. They are throughout the scriptures, but there are certain things that if we do not slow down and think and listen we will often miss out. And what can tend to happen, not saying in your case, but what can tend to happen, the beginning of the book, we think this is just the greeting. Let's go ahead and get past this quickly and then get into the meat of the book. And then as you get to the end, oh, most of it's been said. Now this is just a simple conclusion, concluding words. Well, we're going to focus in on that introduction and on that ending, and we're going to see that it is filled with so much. There is a real sense in which I could take each one of these little elements and expand it to fill the totality of a single service. It could be done. I'm going to strive not to do that, but we have a meal afterwards, so no one needs to rush away. But let us begin to consider from the book of Jude and he simply begins with these words Jude a servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James and I just want to slow down for just a second sometimes we don't know who is being spoken of and who is speaking this is easy to figure out even for the most unskilled among us this is Jude who is writing Jude is the brother of James. But what's not stated in that introduction is this. Jude and James are the brothers of Jesus. But what's curious in this introduction, he does not say Jude, the brother of Jesus. As if somehow that would give him a greater position and a greater authority and, and you should listen to him more. He says, brother of James. And James also, they recognize their roles by the grace of God, having an apostolic service to set forth the word of God. But in all of that's doing, they are not the authority. They are not in themselves the grounds and basis of truth. And he says these words, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. This is the one he would have been somewhat raised with, but he calls himself not a brother, but a servant. Now listen, because of the grace of God, we are adopted. We are sons and daughters of God, and that is a glorious thing because God has revealed to us his purposes. There's a sense like Abraham that we are called friends of God. But it is an important thing that when we consider that privileged intimacy and communion and care that we have with God, that we don't forget we are not peers we are not equals. There is an unquestionable and very clear hierarchy in this relationship. And it's not 
employee to boss. It's far more than that. And the language in here really carries the sense of the term of a slave. Now, we don't use that language very much because it's strong language. And I get that. And it has some negative connotations. But what a glorious thing it is to be a servant or a slave of Jesus Christ. Now, to get a sense of this, because people get confused, the same term, douloi, based on the term doulos, is given to us in Romans chapter 6. It uses these words. Do you not know, verse 16, if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey. Now, people don't like sometimes the clarity of Romans 6 because Romans 6 basically says this, you all slaves, every single one of you are a slave. What you got to figure out is who you're a slave to. And he goes on to say, and you figure it out by who do you obey? You are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, in the context that is obedience to God, which leads to righteousness. You are, well, are there not a third and fourth option? You know, you're saying I'm either a slave of, of sin or a slave of God? Verse 17, but thanks be to God for those who are believers. You who were once slaves of sin... What is the condition of everyone born, a descendant of Adam, born into this world? Slaves of sin. To those who are believers, you were once slaves of sin. But have, thanks be to God, you have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. 6.22 of Romans. But now that you have been set free from sin... Formerly slave of sin, now set free from sin. And some people think, ah, now that I'm free from sin, I can just run around in circles and do what I want. It's better than that. Now that you're set free from sin and how all of your running in circles was in obedience to sin, now you are able to run after Christ in obedience to God, having been set free from sins and have become slaves of God. Mm. The fruit that you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. What a wonderful notion that is. And, And the scriptures give us certain things that we need to hold all of this. Now, as I'm today emphasizing the idea that we are slaves of God, we are slaves of Christ, that does not change our closeness, the uniqueness of our love and communion and intimacy with Him, but it puts us in a humbling position. And one of the problems that sometimes we face is we cling to very important truths of God's Word, our adoption that we are part of the household of God, the family of faith. This is glorious. But sometimes we cling to that to the exclusion of other also important truths revealed in Scripture. Some of you may remember in Luke 17, Jesus gives this example. If someone has a slave who has been out working in the field or tending the sheep, and he comes in after having done that work of the day, What master then says to that slave, oh, sit down and let me serve you? Does that happen? Not at all. He actually says, here's what you do. Now that you're done with that work, serve me and let me eat and be satisfied. And then when you're done, you can go ahead and do those other things. And it says here in Luke chapter 17, verse 9, he does not thank the slave, because he did the things that he was commanded, does he? And we say, no, he doesn't. And maybe we might say it would be nice if he did. But he's giving an example that we're to understand the significance of the illustration. He says this in verse 10. So 
you to, when you do, all the things which are commanded you. Now, I don't know about you, but do you do all the things commanded you? All the time? Even if you did, all the things commanded of you, you ought to say of yourself, we are unworthy slaves. We have only done that which we ought to have done. We have only done our duty. So you say we are unworthy slaves. Now what's amazing is we say that and that keeps us humble and God will say to us when we stand before him because of the grace that was at work within us, well done my good and faithful servant. And we long for that day, but you've got to take the totality of it. I am so privileged to be his servant, so blessed to have had my eyes opened, so privileged to have had my heart made new in Christ that I have become obedient. Oh, thanks to God. And all of this so undeserved, so unearned, such great grace that God has had on me. And so... We want to balance that out. By not seeing all of this, sometimes we start to glory and pray and boast in who we are in Christ. And we should give much thanks and praise. But then that sometimes does not translate to the humility and dedication and ongoing commitment we ought to have seeing ourselves as unworthy, undeserving slaves of God. But oh, how deserving, how worthy my master is of all obedience, of all that he said at all times. Such, a, such an interesting beginning. A, a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James from Jude. We move from looking at how he presents himself as a slave of the Savior to secondly what I call um, appellations or assigns to the addressees. These are specific things that he attributes to those that he's writing to. And these are things I think we oft pass by too quickly and we're gonna just slow down and bask in the breadth of what the scripture says. He says this, and I'm, I'm going to take them in the order that they are in the Greek, which they're in a completely different order in the English. And I'll explain that, and, and we'll, then we'll look into it. It says, to those who are called, beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Well, technically in the Greek it says, to those who are beloved of God, kept for Jesus Christ, called. Okay, that is, that is the called is a, is a third and separate thing. If you read it in the English in the order they've put it, you could almost say, to those who are called beloved. And it's all one flow, and it's not one flow. There are three things being stated there. And the first thing that is being stated, to those who are beloved in God. This is something that I think we too often uh, think too little of and don't take with the measure of depth that we should. When we began Romans 1 not long ago, it said in Romans 1 7 to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. And that is a remarkable statement. And I won again, I think that we, we don't often get the depth of because we glory in the loving kindness of God, the graciousness of God. God, because of his loving character, even his enemies benefit. He causes the sun to rise on his people and his enemies alike. Right? He causes the rain to fall and the harvest to, to come forward and everybody benefits from the loving kindness of God but it is a very different thing to be the object of God's love 
And, and it's something we, ought, we don't ought get so frequently clear in our minds, but since we have, not so long back, as moving through the book of Romans, looked in Romans chapter nine, as it quoted out of the book of Malachi, and it said these words, Jacob I loved, Esau, not so much. No, it says Esau, I hated. And, and we have this distinction that God himself made between these two individuals. And he set those purposes upon them before either of them were born or either of them had done good or evil. One would be the unique and extraordinary object of his love and the other would not. The other would rightly bear the wrath and judgment of God for being and exercising his normal condition of being a slave to sin. And what I want us to begin to see from these things is the way the scriptures lay these things out. Because what an extraordinary thing it is to be loved of God. And I think we take it too lightly because we think, of course he loves us. God is love. And, and or weirdly, we think, of course he loves us. We are wonderful. Whereas we're told in Romans 3, there's no one is righteous. There's no one who does good. We have all together become worthless and we're just when we start to see these things and then we look back at the way the scriptures unpack some of these distinctives that we don't often pay attention to it's said in Deuteronomy 7 7 God speaking to the children of Israel it is not because you were more in number than other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you for you were the fewest of all peoples so speaking of, under the old covenant, how God established a unique relationship of extraordinary love between himself and his covenant people. And in that, God was the determiner. He set his love on them and chose them. And it wasn't because they were the most beautiful or powerful or significant nation. Down in chapter 10 of Deuteronomy, verses 14 and 15, it will go on to say this. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens and the earth and all that is in it. So let me just pause there for a moment. So what belongs to God? That's still an understatement. You said everything, but not enough. Absolutely everything that is, ever was, or ever will be belongs to him. And then with, with this absolute total ownership and mastery over everything, over every kingdom, every nation, on the face of the earth and in the sky and in the heaven of heavens, it says this in Deuteronomy 10, 15. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them. You above all the peoples as you are this day. Now, I, you know, there's a part of me that thinks, and I remember reading these things years back and thinking, no, 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 no. <laughs> that can't be. What, you're, what it seems to be saying is God chose them and they were uniquely distinct and had a special relationship, a special bond of love, a special privilege that was distinct above all the peoples that he set on them and not on anybody else. And there's part of my little human heart that starts to say, I don't know if I feel right about that. You know, unless I'm a part of that group, then I feel good. But if I'm not, then what's going on? And, and what we begin to understand is, we, why do we define God's love with our own expectations and expressions of love. Why do we not learn from the scriptures who he is, 
his absolute authority, his divine rights and prerogative, and how he is pleased to exercise that. And that there is a distinct love that he had to them and not to others is absolutely clear in the scriptures. And it is an extraordinary thing when you begin to see this picture played out. It says this for us in Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, it's, what, a, what a thought. So the one that God, as we come to the members of the new covenant, the new covenant people of God who are redeemed by his blood, listen, God showed his love to me to you who are in Christ, not when you got it all together. Not when you turned away from and started to do right. What were we when God yet demonstrated his love for us? We were sinners. We were unworthy, undeserving, at enmity. There was nothing about us that would distinguish us from the rest of the world in any way as superior or better. And some of us rightly look upon ourselves and say, I kind of know who and what I was. I I was at the bottom of the pack of my fellow sinners in this world. And yet God would show his love towards me while I was yet a sinner. I think we, we're no longer astounded by the love of God because it has been made so superficial and spread so thin and turned into nothing but an emotion and a feeling that doesn't necessarily accomplish anything. But the love of God was demonstrated to us while we were sinners. Christ died for us. Paul writes to the church at Rome, to those who are loved of God and called to be saints. Hebrews 9.15 reminds us of this. Since a death has occurred that redeems. So this death of Christ that was for us while we were sinners, what does it do? It redeems us. It does not leave us where we were. Ephesians 1, 4 and following says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 3 says this, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the sons of God. And so we are. I mean, that is extraordinary love. That is immeasurable, remarkable, distinctive, separating love. And the scripture reminds us of this. Well, how do I know if I am loved of God in this way? One of the beautiful pictures we're given in Romans 5, 5 says this. Hope does not disappoint or does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the spirit whom he has given to us. And then 1 John again takes it and clarifies all of that in 1 John 4, 19. We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. And when we understand that our love for God, our desire for Christ, our, our, our longing for redemption and for holiness, our, our craving for the coming of his kingdom is all because of the mercies of God that have been given to us by his spirit. We love because he first loved us. I'll read one more verse as we move on to the next thought. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 4 to 6 says this, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. 
Well, how does he know that these ones are like the children of Israel were? How does he know these are the ones who are loved of God? How does he know these are the ones that are chosen? These are things that make people oft uncomfortable, but we ought not be uncomfortable with biblical language, should we? We ought to seek to understand it. We know Brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you. Not only in word, but also in the power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. How do we know that you were loved of God? That you were chosen of God? By his mercies, he granted through his spirit that you would hear the gospel with full conviction that you would respond in repentance and faith. Thanks be to God that we have become obedient from the heart. Oh, what what an amazing thing that he says to these addressees that they are beloved in God. Then he goes on further and says, kept for Jesus. And I just want to note this. We sometimes tend to think, kept for heaven and sometimes we long for heaven and in those descriptions we get all caught up in oh mansions of glory you know and streets of gold and we get all caught up in these descriptions and listen you will see jesus christ And you will be like him, for you will see him as he is. And the dwelling place of God will be with man. I could care less about some mansion or room or thing. We get to dwell with Christ and see the full, unabated glory of God. I mean, this is something. We are kept for Jesus. We are His, and He is for us. Listen to what it says, and and the simple terms there, that word there, kept, means um, guarded, restrained, preserved, protected. He makes sure that we are kept for Him until that final day. We are being guarded by the power of God for that blessed promise that God has set before us and so keep that in mind and I'm going to have to press on moving through this so we are loved of God we are kept guarded preserved for Jesus how many will be lost not a one will Jesus lose any of all that the father has given him he says I will not lose one of all the father has given me but raise them up on the last day if one of those little sheepsies goes a wandering off are they going to be left what will he do that great shepherd of the sheep is going to leave those 99 in the field and he's going to go after that lost sheep and he's going to go after him until he finds him he is going to lay hold of him he's going to put him upon his shoulders and he is going to bring him home What a wonderful thing. We are kept for Christ by the power of God. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful picture. And of course, it tells us that also in the beginning of 2 Peter, which I encourage you to read. Further than that, not only are we precious, loved by God, not only are we preserved, kept for Christ, Christ, we are also produced by the very power of God. We are called it said in Romans 1 7 we were called loved by God and called to be saints in Romans 8 28 it says we know that all things that for those who love God all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose and this is where a little bit of instruction a little bit of clarity is helpful for us because there are two distinct uses of the term called in the New Testament In the Gospels, and primarily Matthew, we have statements like, many are called, but few are chosen. In Matthew, the call is often the call that we issue to our fellow men. Come to Christ. Turn from your sin. Follow Him. We call them. Invite them. Urge them to.
to turn from these things and to believe in Jesus. When Paul uses the term called, he doesn't use it usually in the sense of invitation. He uses it in the stronger sense of how God calls something into being and how by the very statement of God's word, it comes. For example, if there is nothing but darkness and God says, let there be light, what happens? There is light. Does not depend on the willing and interest of the darkness to give way a little bit, nor does it depend on anything. When God calls, it is accomplished. And it is a wonderful work. The scriptures give us those instructions in 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and following. It's, it reminds us, uh, we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews. Okay, so the Jewish people, they will rile against it. And folly or foolishness to the Gentiles. That's the non-Jews. So now here we've got a problem. If the Jews are offended by the gospel of a crucified Christ and the Gentiles, everybody else, thinks it's foolishness, who's being saved? Oh no! But then, that's not the end of it, isn't it? Yeah, we keep reading. But to those who are called. And in this call, what happens? Both Jews and Greeks. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Here we were feeling like it is foolish. And the power of God, by the working of the Spirit, gives us understanding. And we no longer find the gospel foolish. We find the gospel as the most true, most foundational reality in all creation and history. And we no longer find it offensive. We find it the most endearing, the most desirable, the most wonderful truth ever known to man. Even the scriptures tell us these things in 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. Here's the reality. If I call you, you may not come. But when he calls, we come. And it is a beautiful, beautiful work of God. And we come joyfully, we come willingly, we come humbly because he has opened our hearts and minds to grasp the richness of the gospel who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so what happened when he called you? You are no longer in darkness, you are now where? Light And he who was previously keeping you blinded so you could not see the glory of the light of Christ in the gospel has transferred you to the kingdom of his son and of light and you love him and you repent as do I. Romans 9 puts it this way. It says this, verse 24, in terms of God's saving purposes and mercy that he has purposed, it says, even us whom he has called. Not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. The distinctiveness among all peoples and all places is the unique call of God that summons His people remarkably because it gives life where there was not life. We oft hail to that wonderful example where Lazarus was in the grave. If you and I were to call to Lazarus while he's in his grave, what's happening? Nothing. Not only nothing, he can't even hear us because he is dead and gone. But when Jesus called him, what did he say? Lazarus, come forth. And what did Lazarus do? He came forth. Because in that call, he was given life. In that call, oh brothers and sisters, we are given life 
and we come. What a glorious call of God. It says here, even us whom he called, not only the Jews, the Gentiles, indeed, as he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And those who were not beloved, I will call beloved. Listen, we are right, would rightly be judged and condemned of God. Yet in mercy, he looked upon us and did not leave us in our condemnation. But he said, beloved, my people. And he sent Christ to make it sure. Can you think of anything greater? Anything more glorious? What a God who has done such a wonderful thing for us. Now let's, let's move on, if we could, and continue to worship God. Not only does he begin with that uh, beginning, to those who are beloved in God, kept for Jesus, who are called, but then verse two says, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Here's the beauty of it. Because of his call and his purposes in Christ for us before the foundation of the world, mercy Love and peace have been given to us. But he says, may it be multiplied to you. So what I have, there is yet more that will be poured out. And what I yet know, there is but more to be experienced. This speaks of an enlarging experience and expression of it. Regarding mercy, for example. It says this, First th- uh, Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, Paul says, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy. I mean, like it, it's not, but then I turned, but then I made it right, but I received mercy. He understands everything he did in real response to the call of men and the the statement of the gospel all he did is because he was a recipient of the mercy of God which means he received what he did not deserve and could not earn and then Hebrews says this in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace listen that we may receive mercy and help in a time of need. Oh, I thank God for first mercy. (laughs) Without first mercy, there's no hope. But I thank God for the present trials and the ongoing struggles. That was not the end of His mercy. But even today, He will meet me with mercy. He will meet you with mercy. We can come to His throne of grace and find mercy and help in a time of need. May mercy be multiplied to you. And sometimes we're in those circumstances where we know it. I need, I feel like I need more mercy this week than I may have in a previous one. Have you been there? It it, it happens. And here's the beauty. His grace is abundant. His mercy is abundant. It is always sufficient for the trouble of the day. And so we look to him and we can come to him with confidence. What a great privilege. Not only that peace says this, Romans 5, 1. Since we have been justified by, pe- by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, praise God for first peace, right? As, as with first mercy. The fact that I who was at enmity with God, estranged from God, as the scripture says, hostile within me towards God, Jesus has reconciled. And now I have peace. I, though a sinner, have peace with a holy God through the Holy One and His righteousness is, that is counted to me. Oh, what a gift. We have peace. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing 
so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. I have peace with God, but there are times and circumstances in life I'm thankful for that peace with God, but things aren't so peaceful, right? May he fill you with peace and joy. And the scripture reminds us that because of our confidence in Christ, we have a peace with God that passes understanding. And we remind ourselves of those things in the midst of those trials, in the midst of those agonies. I love again, it said in 2 Peter 1, 2, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why I urge you, if you find yourself struggling with the experience of peace, the reality of peace is fixed, peace with God is fixed by Christ. But if you're struggling with an experience of that peace, it says this, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, get in the word. Get into a deeper contemplation of who God is as your knowledge of God grows his purposes his authority his sovereignty his wisdom you know what that what effect that has upon us peace my father sees me my father knows my struggles his eye is upon me his hand is with me Indeed, I am never alone. It's just a beautiful, beautiful promise and picture. And then beyond that, Romans 12, 18 says this, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So a peace, an experience of peace, and then we live peaceably with one another. Peace and mercy and love May love be multiplied. Why? For we know, brothers, loved of God, that he's chosen you, it said in 1 Thessalonians 1.4. But then Philippians 1.9 says this. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. We all know we don't love God as he deserves to be loved, Right? We don't praise him as he deserves to be praised because it's beyond our present comprehension and capacity. But someday. And those of us who have been shown mercy, we show mercy to others. Those of us who have been forgiven, we forgive others. This is the beautiful enlarging of experience and expression. Now go with me, if you would, to verse 24. In verse 24 of Jude... God's word simply says this. Now to him who is able. Now there's a part of me that just wants to pause right there. To him who is able. There's so much you and I are not able to do. Right? We're aware of it. Others sometimes remind us of it. You know, what, what, our lack, our insufficiencies, our inabilities. But when we speak of God, to Him who is able. And after that, you could kind of just fill in the blank, could you not? And, and, and the way that I've put it here in our, in our notes is, it, as a simple reminder, it's the absolute ability of God to accomplish all that he wills to him who is able not only the ability of God we are reminded in the Psalms in a number of places Psalm 15 Psalm 35 he does all that he pleases not only is he able he does all that he pleases what a remarkable thing and I just want to share with you there's a few verses in the scriptures and I'm just going to hit them in rapid succession, drink them in, uh, verses that speak about the great ability of our God. As three men are in a fiery furnace in the days of Daniel, they say to the king, if this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. 
from being uh, from the burning of the fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand O king I mean where did we have any historic evidence of people being thrown in burning furnaces and surviving that that wasn't there but they didn't look merely to history they looked to the one who holds all of history in his hands and they simply said this he is able well the thing is scientifically that's not possible well he is still able can he make the sun stand still in the sky can he make it go backwards yes he can all the things that he is able to do and not only did they declare that he is able in order that we would learn the lesson what happened to these three men they stood in that fiery furnace they walked on out without the slightest singe to their clothes or scent of smoke upon them they were delivered utterly and I can't help but think when I hear the words deliverance brothers and sisters by the grace of God in Christ we are delivered from our sins he is able to deliver us oh but I've done this this deserves the lake of sulfur this deserves the burning is he able to deliver us he is absolutely able to deliver the chief of sinners is he able to del deliver someone who even men have found rightly condemned that he would be crucified on a cross next to Jesus? Even though he's not going to have a life to do a bunch of good deeds and prove himself worthy? He is able to deliver. Our salvation depends on the power of God, not on our power. And it is sure because of his power that is at work even in us that's why we're changed and it's such a beautiful picture and I just think so that someday we will stand before him in his presence as it says later in this chapter and it says what without spot or blemish there isn't going to be the tinge the soiling or the scent of sin Christ took it all we are completely cleansed in a way that we cannot comprehend because we don't we don't comprehend the depth of our sin let me move on more quickly if i'm able daniel 4 37 speaks says nebuchadnezzar works in his pride he says this at the end of verse 37 he is able to humble those who walk in pride 2 Timothy 1.12 says, regarding those who have been granted faith, those who have believed, it says this, I am convinced, for 2 Timothy 1.12, he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. He is able to do it. Hebrews uh, 2.18, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So in all the things that we would face in life and we'd be filled with doubt and uncertainty and we'd recognize, I don't know if I can do this. We need not worry whether we can do it. He is able. and We can go to his throne of grace and find mercy and help in a time of need. Jude 1, 24, or, or uh, so much is there. Hebrews 7, 25, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Uh, Romans 16, 25, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel. And our passage here in Jude, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you in the presence of his glory with great might. And I just uh, will quickly cover the remaining thoughts very briefly. He is able to keep you from stumbling and I from stumbling and we say I don't understand that James 2 10 says this uh, or, or James 3 2 says this if uh, for we all stumble in many ways if anyone does not stumble in what he says he's a perfect man and able to bridle his own body so please help me it says he's able to keep me from stumbling and then another verse says we all stumble in many ways so which is it 
Well, it is both, but we've got to look a little bit more closely at this. We all stumble in many ways. Some of you, in some ways, have stumbled since it turned 2023. Now I'm getting a giggle because some of you are thinking a little bit of stumbling was going on this morning. Right? But listen, the, the, the phrase here in Jude is the idea of the safekeeping surety of God that we are guaranteed to be guarded by God himself. Because the word here is not, merely, not simply the idea of stumbling. There will be stumbling. But this very same word is used in just a couple other verses. And I'll give you one. James 2.10, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point becomes accountable for it all. Brothers and sisters, we will stumble, but we will not finally fail. We will finally not fall. The origins of this word has the idea of someone being cast fully to the ground off of a horse. Now, you and I may find ourselves jostled around a bit. You know, we may find ourselves, you know, with just one foot left in the stirrup and hanging off the side. But we are not going to the ground. The, the, the beauty of this, and this is actually what is said in Psalm 37, uh, verse uh, 23 and 24. David says this, The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. Well, we will have struggles, we will have stumbles, but he keeps us sure. You know, the, such a beautiful power, and I'll read this verse, 1 Peter 1, 3 and following. According to his great mercy, he caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last days. And how does this culminate this passage here? He is able to do this and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Sometimes when there had been pre-appearances of God in the Old Testament, and they would say, oh no, we think we have seen God, we may die. You remember Samson's parents. But we, because we are in Christ, will see him with great joy. We will approach without doubt, without fear, without hesitation because we are completely blameless in his sight because of our Savior. We are treated as and looked upon as perfect. And I find that stunning because I know that's not me and that God would be pleased to look upon me as such because of his son we will be caused to stand we will be perfect we will be pre presented in his glory with great joy and then it ends by saying these words at the end of the to the only God there are not many gods there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that great three in one, not the ideas of men. There is but one God, God the singular, God our Savior, to the one God, our Savior through Jesus Christ. And God is supreme. To Him be. Not to Him is given, but to Him always has been and always shall be glory. We don't make him glorious. We don't add to his essential glory. We recognize his glory. We respond to his glory. Glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. What's remarkable is this. Glory and majesty are these two biggest terms that they could come up with to speak of absolute excellence, beauty, beauty and perfection. Then dominion and authority to speak of absolute ownership, mastery, and the right to do all that he pleases. All glory, 
majesty, dominion, and authority. Since when? Before all time. Even now and now. For how long? And forevermore. This is the one and only God where there is no beginning, no ending, the no changing God. We have simply seen today, as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together, eight simple ideas that I'll remind you of. The first thing we saw is that Jude recognized he was a slave of the Savior. And in all the blessings we have to be loved of God and adopted in Christ, it's important to remember how unworthy we are and what a privilege it is to serve and obey such a great Savior. Secondly, we saw the appellations there that they are precious, they are preserved, and they are produced by the very person and work of God himself. Then further, we see the scripture spoke of an enlarging of experience and expression of mercy. First mercy and met with more mercy. First peace and an ongoing experience of peace with God, with our circumstances, and with one another. And an enlargement of our love, our experience, and our expression of love. The scriptures then went on to speak of the absolute ability of God to accomplish all that he will to him who is able. In that, many of the doubts and the strongest struggles of saints, but how will I stay till the end? Well, he is able, and he will keep you. He will guard you. It is guaranteed. The safekeeping is sure. And he will present you perfect in the presence of God with glory and great joy. And this God is the God, the one God, the God who has always existed, the God through whom everything exists, exists, the God who owns everything that exists, the God who orchestrates all that exists, and the God who has been pleased to save unworthy sinners like you and me. God the Savior, God the Supreme, the one who has all majesty, glory, dominion, and authority. No beginning, no end, no change. What hope? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and the time that we could spend in it this morning, even as it prepares us so well to come to the Lord's Supper as we contemplate who you are and what you have accomplished. Lord, we understand that our acceptance with God is not because of our own doing, but it is because your mercy. It is by grace that we have been saved and not our own doing. We are so thankful, God, for what you have given us in Christ. And we don't fully understand the breadth and depth and height of all that is ours in him but a glimpse of these things today in these passages causes us to be humbled and to give you praise and glory. Lord, we pray that you would be exalted among us. Even now as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together, we remember that Jesus gave thanks for the bread that he broke and for the cup. Lord, we are so thankful that Christ was the perfect spotless Lamb of God who took our sin upon himself that our sin would be washed completely clean that we would someday stand before you perfect in your presence in Christ Jesus that his righteousness would be accounted to us and that we would be saved to the uttermost what great grace you've given us Lord thank you for the body of Christ that he who knew no sin he who was the eternal perfectly obedient son of God would become sin for us so that we would become the righteousness of God in him. We thank you for his shed blood that brought forth the new covenant in his blood that makes us from who we were to who we are in him. Lord, we thank you that because of Christ, you are pleased to look upon us and call us your people, your beloved, that you have given to us your spirit and written your law upon our hearts and minds. We thank you, O God, that you have set us free from sin and caused us to be obedient from the heart. 
we give you all praise and all thanks and all glory and we thank you that you've given us these elements that we would remember the body and the blood the accomplishing work of Christ on our behalf through these things we thank you for it in Jesus name amen